Hey everybody, welcome to the Teal Teardown Hockey Podcast, where we're here to tear down the games, stories, and news for the San Jose Sharks. I'm your host, David Victoria, and I am pleased to have you join me as we follow Team Teal into the Macklin Celebrini era. But first, I want to talk about how we got here. How are the Sharks at the bottom of the standings and only now trying to get their way back to the top with their young prospects and young blood coming into the team now? With that, I want to start at the 2019 Conference Finals. The last season the Sharks were competitive and the crossroads that led us to where we are today. At this point, the Sharks had a lot of older guys and maybe guys kind of in their primes that weren't as good as the Thorntons and Marlows, like your Thomas Hurdle, your, your Timo Meyer, but they didn't have any young blood coming into the team. And the season before, Doug Wilson, the GM at the time, um, acquired Eric Carlson, and after that season, they deci- he decided to sign him for an eight-year contract extension. His understanding being that he could, being a, like a stud star defenseman, he could be the guy that could kind of carry the rest of the team into a new era with, where the Sharks would still be competitive and try and get cups. Uh, this was the same mentality that he probably had when he signed, when he acquired Joe Thornton from the Boston Bruins back in the day. I mean, once the Sharks actually got Joe Thornton, sit, during his prime up until he uh, left the Sharks, he was like a really like the the reason that the Sharks were competitive for so many years and always in the conversation to win a cup. You could build around that kind of a guy, and that's kind of the mentality that Doug Wilson had. Unfortunately. Uh, Eric Carlson was when I, we got him. He was like already had some injury history. He had a crazy 2017 run where he ran on one ankle basically, and the other one was just completely torn apart. Versus when the Sharks got Thornton, he was 26 years old, just entering his prime, no injury history, and you know the rest wrote itself basically. So one thing about signing Eric Carlson that 11.5 million dollar average annual value contract for eight years was. They put the Sharks in a cap trap situation, and they had to let Joe Pavelski go. Doug Wilson took a gamble on Pavelski, even though he was the heart and soul of this team, at least since 2015. Um, he assumed that Pavelski was being 34 years old, that he kind of was past his best years, and that uh, Doug Wilson could use that money on another potentially young star, which would be money you would throw at Kane and Meyer in the future. Um, obviously this gamble didn't work well. Pavelski had an incredible three years with the Dallas Stars, and um, obviously we're going to get to the point where the Sharks with Eric Carlson were never really that competitive. They would never make the playoffs up until now. Um, they would always be kind of stuck in that mushy middle spot where they could win some games. You know, there'd be some exciting games to watch. You had stars like Hurdle, Meyer, Kane doing their things with Eric Carlson, but they never really ended up doing anything amazingly competitive during that time. Um, there were some bright spots during this time, obviously. Timo Meyer scored five goals in January 2022. That comes to mind. And obviously, uh, during the 2022-2023 season, Eric Carlson would score 101 points um, and win the Norris Trophy, which was probably the the best thing for him because he was actually tradable afterwards because the Sharks at this point, when that happened, they were not competitive at all. Um, and there was no way that they could continue to be competitive with this contracts that were hampering them. So um, the Sharks would realize they would have to move on from this and make some big changes. So during that season, unfortunately, Doug Wilson uh, got ill. So he had to step down and assistant manager Joe Will kind of took over. But the vision was overall still the same for Doug Wilson. And uh, the Sharks were still kind of doing what they did to try and survive and, and just maintain co- competitiveness, but nothing really worked. So during that offseason, Joe Will would be relieved of his duties, and then we would enter the Mike Greer era. So this is Mike Greer's first stint as an NHL general manager. In terms of previous like front office experience, he's been a scout with the Chicago Blackhawks in the past and an assistant coach with the New Jersey Devils for a brief time. And he was then the most recent thing he uh, did before becoming the general manager was he worked as the hockey operations advisor for the New York Rangers. Back, and he was hired back in 2021, but uh, he would obviously build some relationships there and bring them on to the San Jose Sharks when he became general manager on July 5th, 2022. The first thing he would do is fire coach Bob Bugner after three mediocre seasons and hire former New York Rangers coach David Quinn to try and get this new era of the Sharks started. During this offseason, uh, Brent Burns also asked for a trade. 
you know, he's a complete legend for the Sharks. You had to kind of respect what he asked for. He could kind of see where the direction the Shark, the team was going. And having another puck-moving defenseman like Eric Carlson kind of burdened him. And you could see during those seasons before, um, Eric Carlson, uh, when he was actually injured, Brent Burns was the better player versus when Brent Burns was out, the rare times Carlson didn't really pick up the pace the way Burns did. And just that, that experience just never worked with the two of them. So anyways, you let him go. Let our Eric Carlson be the n true number one offensive defenseman. Ended up working out. So Brent Burns and Lane Pedersen went to the Carolina Hurricanes for Steven Lorenz, Itu Mekanyemi, and a 2023 conditional third round pick. Now one thing I really liked about what Greer did during his first year was he didn't make any rash trades or anything he had to do. Brent Burns asked for that trade. He had to respect it because of the tenure Brent Burns uh, had with the Sharks. But he didn't really do anything but fill some holes and see what he had. I respect this from him because it reminds me of the 2014 Maple Leafs when Brandon Shanahan came as president and he didn't do anything his first year. The Leafs were in a kind of tailspin of... Um, always missing the playoffs and everything just seemed like it didn't make any sense. So the first year, Shanahan sat on his hands before a year later, just tearing everything down from the coaches to the GMs to the scouting, everything and rebuilt everything. So what I really respect about Greer here is he had the patience to wait, see what he had before making any decisions. But during that same season, um, Timo Meyer was having a contract year, having a good year in the NHL and the direction Mike Greer could, you could see was going was more of a rebuild. So he decided to trade Meyer at the trade deadline. And he did acquire some great pieces. In hindsight, at the time, looked great now. But at the time, I do remember fans were not very happy with it. So Timur Meyer was traded for Fabian Zetterland, Andreas Janssen, Shakir Mukhamadoulin, and a 2023 first-round pick, which would become Quinton Musty. Now, another notable trade that Mike Greer would make is trading Eric Carlson to the Pittsburgh Penguins for Michael Granlund, Mike Hoffman, Jan Ruda, and a 2024 first-round pick. What made this trade so great is that before this happened, before his Norris Trophy season and his 101 points, his contract was thought to be untradeable. He had still five years left, $11.5 million a year, and he had a lot of injured seasons where he didn't play a full season at all. And it just seemed like even if you retained 50%, you were not going to get anything good back. So the fact that Mike Greer traded Eric Carlson away, only retained $1.6 million, so Carlson's contract was only worth $10 million for the Pittsburgh Penguins, is nothing short of a miracle. And the fact that the Sharks got back Mikael Granlund, who had a great season last year, uh, he's having a good start to the season this year. He's actually showing he can be a decent fill-in as number one center for this rebuilding Sharks team. Uh, they also acquired Mike Hoffman, who was not really great, but he was just a body. Uh, Jan Ruda, who came off of a Stanley Cup champions uh, championship from the Tampa Bay Lightning, who then went to Pittsburgh. So he had that kind of pedigree that was useful to have. And there's that 2024 useful first round pick. So I would say that that trade was great for Greer. He got kind of cleaned out the contract and made, paved the road for the future of the rebuild. But the rebuild was not ready yet. We're still in the middle of that teardown where we had to deal with the painful season of last year. So in his second, as the second season as Greer was the GM of the San Jose Sharks, we were all in on tanking for Macklin Celebrini. That offseason, Greer really didn't add too many players. He kind of filled some holes here and there. Uh, but the whole goal was really to tank for the first overall pick, which was Macklin Celebrini, who was touted to be a very, very good high-end center with a lot of great potential. And during that season as well was a contract year for Tomas Hurdle, and the Sharks had to make a big decision, either to re-sign him for eight years. Hurdle loved San Jose. He probably would have signed that long as well. But Greer, again, was paving the road for this new uh, organization, this new system, this rebuild, and uh, he decided to trade Hurdle away and a 2025 third and a 2027 third for David Edstrom and a 2025 first round pick. Now at the time, people were not happy about this trade either. They thought that, you know, we got nothing for Hurdle and all we're just doing was dumping everything. And I remember uh, being very heartbroken because he's just the heart, one of the hearts and the lovable guys of the Sharks that had to go. But even though the, pain, the season was painful, it was necessary. And now looking back at what we got for the trade for Hurdle, it does look very, very good. We would end up trading David Edstrom and the first round pick for 
Yaroslav Askarov, which was an amazing, amazing deal. So in the end, like at the time, people really like criticized Greer for that trade, but in the end, ended up becoming a very, very huge get with this the, probably the best goalie prospect in the NHL right now in Askarov. So that offseason as well, after the Sharks tanked, uh, they ended up getting the first overall pick. They got Macklin Celebrini, and they also, with the Pittsburgh pick, which was the 12th pick overall, and they got Sam Dickinson, who's supposed to be a very high-end defenseman. Potentially, he's, his ceiling is is pretty high, but he has some skating issues, and there's things he has to work on where if he doesn't even quite make it, he might be a bottom-pairing defenseman at worst. But... Um, I would say that these are two big gets, and without the Carlson trade, we would not be able to get that Dickinson uh, pick. And without the Hurdle trade, we would not have Askarov in the system as we speak. Now, during that offseason as well, uh, Greer, because he's a green guy, decides to hire a green coach in Ryan Warsawski. He's a 36-year-old coach, and he was seen as a relatable voice for the young players. And now I want to talk about Macklin Celebrini. The Sharks' first overall pick in 2024. Last year was a very painful year for Sharks fans because as they knew the year before, they tanked and they hoped to get Connor Bedard, but there's no guarantee and they ended up not getting uh, Connor Bedard. Same thing, the Sharks fans had to watch this team really, really struggle throughout the whole year with the maybe, maybe having a chance to get that first overall pick. And they got lucky and got Celebrini and this kid, I gotta say, is the real deal. During the Prospects tournament, he looked like he was steps above anybody else. No one was even close to his skill level. During the preseason, he really shined against uh, other NHL potential prospects and even NHL stars. He just looked like he belonged. And his first game, he ended up scoring two points, and he just looked like he fit in completely. Unfortunately, he did suffer a lower body injury. And as of today, October 21st, he's still going to be out for two more weeks. But there was a lot of promise with this kid. In Boston University last year, in 38 games, he scored 32 goals, 32 assists, and got 64 points. I listened to the Steve Dangle podcast this summer, and they were talking about Macklin Celebrini. And Steve Dangle does have an NCAA scout as a reference. And he asked him, like, well, how is this Macklin Celebrini kid going to be? And the scout said, he's obviously going to be the best graduate ever to come from the NCAA to graduate to the NHL. And then Steve Dangle said, well, what about Eichel? And the scout said, no, no, ever, like ever. Even better than Eichel, this kid is the real deal and he's the best that's probably ever to come. So that has a lot of hype coming in. And so far, it's only been one game, unfortunately. Like I said, he's injured, but he has looked incredible. And the future just looks really bright with this kid leading the way. So we talked a bit about the past and the potential future of the Sharks. Let's talk about this season. We're already six games in, and the Sharks have still no win as the time I'm speaking right now. There are some bright spots. Tyler Toffoli has been absolutely incredible. He's the only guy that's over a point a game. He has four goals and three assists, and he just pretty much is the only guy that looks like an NHL star from the any time right now. Uh, Mikhail Granlin, like I've said uh, previously earlier in this podcast, he has looked very, very good. He hasn't had a goal yet. But he's been looking good as holding up as a first-line setter right now. He's got six assists, and he doesn't look as bad as what we've been seeing before. He has gotten a few penalties, but overall, I would say, considering what is expected of him and what he's actually capable of, being not really being a, a perfect first-line setter and being asked to do that, he has been remarkable. And William Eklund is another guy who has looked incredible. Now, the first two, like two seasons ago, we didn't know what we were getting. He was just really, really young, and it's kind of foreshadowing some of the other guys I'm going to talk about. But uh, Eklund this year, he looks like an incredible NHL player. He still has some things to learn, but he is looking like he has heart, he has effort, the skill is there, and the, the future is looking bright for him. So he is another shining point that I have seen there. Obviously, Macklin Celebrini, before his injury, that, that one game he had, he looked incredible. So hopefully when he comes back, we're going to get to see more of him. But I feel that the Sharks will be playing a lot better when he joins the lineup. Uh, Fabian Zetterlund, uh, he bragged this offseason about how much muscle he's gained. He's been, I heard that he was just really, really working on just getting stronger, and he it really shows. He has three goals already in six games, which is pretty good considering how bad the Sharks' start was. So those are some bright spots, I would say that are on this team, even though there's a lot of bad, bad things, there are still some good things that we can look at. And now I can go to the actual bad things that we can go to, uh, which is number one, the penalties. So the Sharks, 
You could say they're being lazy. There's a little bit of that, but I just think they're just outclassed by better players. The, the lineups we're getting, other than the Eklund to Foley and Grandlin line, are not really like second or third line type types in the NHL versus their competition. So you're seeing that they're either being outspeeded, so they'll have like, you know, they're Someone's going too fast for them, so they'll make a, a poor decision with their stick, or they'll trip, or they'll, they'll hook, they'll do something, and it's looking pretty bad. So even the last three games, the Sharks have had about 14 penalty minutes per game on average, and that's just not acceptable. you got to be working towards not letting that happen, because the more penalty power plays you give the other team, they're going to at least get one or two of them, and that's enough for them to win a game against the Sharks, where it's already hard enough to score goals. So that's one thing that... I think the Sharks really got to look to figure out is how to prevent these penalties from happening. Keep your stick down. You know, if you're out sped, maybe let them let them have that breakaway. Don't don't trip somebody, you know. You're just going to end up hurting the Sharks in the long run for the team. Another person I want to talk about is Will Smith. I'm hearing a lot of San Jose Sharks fans in the Reddit spheres and the other places. They're not really happy with how he's performed. Got to remind you, he's a 19-year-old kid. It's his first season in the NHL. Even the management knows that they can't have him playing every game because it might be too much for him. I think that the plan was Will Smith was going to play as long as Macklin Celebrini was kind of there. So the true load management, I would say, is that Will Smith is sitting on the shoulders of Celebrini who could carry him. But when Will Smith is by himself, there's just too much of a magnifying glass on this kid. And there, the skill's there. It's just that, you know, he's still figuring the game out and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, I want to go back to talking about Eklund, like I just said before. Two years ago, Eklund looked like a little kid. He had no idea what he was doing at all. And now he's starting to look more like a veteran figuring things out. With Will Smith, I feel it's the same thing. The skill's there. He's a great player. I think we just need to be a little bit patient with him and just let him grow. If Game 1 Will Smith is a shadow of Game 82 Will Smith, or when a Game 82 for the Sharks happens... That's a win in my book. Will Smith doesn't need to have like 30 goals or 80 points. He just needs to show that he's grown then and then have a true off season where he can actually build muscle and see. They call the first uh, off season for an NHL player the first NHL off season for them where they actually know what it takes to, to grow and be competitive. So they'll actually have like a workout and like all these types of ways to get better for that off season. So... Just we got to push the growth learning curve here. Let this team grow and figure things out. They are going to get better in this, as the season progresses. I do have confidence in Orsovsky and the coaching crew and this team in front of them. Toffoli is, like I said, looks like a stud. He's a great leader to help everyone out. And not to mention, there are a few injuries on this team where players are going to come back. Mark Edward Vlasic, I know he's not as the guy he was 10 years ago, but last year he did show in the second half of the season that he can be a better defenseman than he has been in the past. He's kind of more engaged. He's a little bit better positionally. I feel that with that veteran presence, he'll be very useful, whether he can put him in the first pairing or the third pairing. I think we just got to wait for that out. And Shakir Makamadoulin coming back will be another great, great addition. We just got to remember that this team, the teardown just finished last year. The rebuild starts this year. Even if the Sharks finish bottom division again, the positive thing is we can get another first overall pick maybe a top five pick, whatever it is, the Sharks can use that player in the future and there's just more potential prospects to come in. So all we got to look at for this team right now is let them figure it out and just enjoy the talent that you do have. And just, there is some excitement around this team. Just don't give up on the hope and just let, trust the Greer process. Let the plan happen. All right, and that'll do it for the first episode of the Teal Teardown Hockey Podcast. Thank you all for listening, wherever you are, whatever you're doing. I appreciate you finding me here and listening to me rant about the San Jose Sharks. If you want any more content, you can find me on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Play, X, or Twitter, whatever you want to call it, and Instagram. Thank you all, and take care.